Hey, it's Brandon. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for the download. Hope you're having a great week. Hey, I've got a great episode for you today. I had a conversation with Gary Hamill. He is the author of Humanocracy, Creating Organizations as Amazing as the People Inside Them. In a nutshell, this book is all about removing bureaucracy from our organizations. It's so weird that in 2020, we even have to to say that we should be having our people bring their whole selves to work, be comfortable doing that. And instead, like, let's get rid of the layers that we have. So that way people can have autonomy and freedom and they'll collaborate better with each other and build positive relationships. So Gary uh, dives in deep and we had a great conversation around his book and the ideas within it. So hope you enjoy the episode as much as I did. Uh, please, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, just go over to the app, Apple Podcast app and just click the five star rating. That would be really helpful and help more people like yourself find this show. We are kind of on fire right now as far as like uh, new listeners and downloads. So I love watching the numbers go up. Um, but of course, that's not everything that's important. What's important is that the ideas that we're sharing here is going to help you transform your workplace for the better. So hope you enjoy. I would love to hear from you. If you would love to reach out LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, any of those places are, are a good way to reach me. Have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you next Tuesday. Gary, it's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Brandon, my pleasure indeed. You wrote a book called Humanocracy, Creating Organizations as Amazing as the People Inside Them. What does the data right now say about whether or not employees get to bring their gifts, their talents to work? Because I think that's really what you're saying in this book is that people need to be able to come to work and bring their whole self their creativity, their ideas, and have ownership over their work. Yeah, I think we can quickly look at some data kind of high level and then medium and then granular. The high level data says that around the world, and certainly that's true in the United States, the majority of people really no longer think, quote, the system works for them. A study back in May, this is a Harris poll in the United States, found that only 29% of Americans thought that the capitalism still works for the average American. A global survey across 28 countries found that only 56% of people think capitalism does more harm than good. And when you dig underneath that, obviously the problem is not that people are against free markets and against entrepreneurship and so on, but they understand that the system works way better for the few than it does for the many. And we've seen in growing income inequality with each passing generation since the Second World War, the percentage of young people who make it into the middle class has been going down. And so there is this unease, this angst. And, you know, every human being is looking for dignity, for opportunity, for equity. They want a feeling that their life matters, their work matters, that they have the chance to grow themselves, but also to better the situation of their family. And for equity, the sense that the rewards are distributed fairly. And obviously, over the last few years, the CEO class, the investor class have done very well, everybody else not so well. So that's kind of the big picture. And I think a lot of that is related to how people feel at work. Gallup's global data says that around the world, just 15%, 15%, 1-5% of people are truly engaged in their work. You know, that's kind of a stunning statistic when you think about it, because it means the other 85% are showing up physically, but are probably not bringing much of their ingenuity, their initiative to work, and are getting a very low emotional return on their efforts. And then you get more grander than that, and the data gets even more disconcerting. You find that only one out of five employees will tell you that they really believe their ideas matter at work. About one in 10 say they're free to experiment with new methods, solutions of products. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates that 70% of all jobs in the U.S. economy require little or no originality. And that obviously, Brandon, says nothing about the people in those jobs, but it does say a lot about our tendency and the bureaucratic tendency to kind of treat human beings as mere resources, as 
semi-programmable robots. And behind that is the typical caste system of thinkers at the top, doers at the bottom, managers, employees, the clever and the compliant. So yeah, there's a lot we should be concerned about. And if nothing else, you know, here we are up against COVID, up against a string of challenges behind that, like global warming, climate change, mass economic migration, and so on. And yet many organizations are wasting more human capacity than they use. Given the challenges around us, I think that's indefensible. You wrote that in talking about bureaucracy, because that still exists in today's workplaces. You wrote that, like all technologies, bureaucracy is a product of its time. What did you mean by that exactly? And where do we go from here? Well, bureaucracy, at least in its kind of modern incarnation, was invented in the late 19th century. And it was really the mashup of two ideas, Brandon. One, of military command structures that go back, you know, the familiar hierarchy that goes back as far as we go in human history. And then more contemporaneously at the time was the new principles of, quote, scientific management and industrial engineering. And so you basically have the architecture of our organizations comes from the military, command and control. The ideology comes from industrial engineering. You can call that controlism. But the goal is to maximize compliance with work standards, schedules, custom demands, and so on. And the problem that those early kind of management pioneers were setting out to solve was how do you deliver efficiency at scale? And thank goodness they succeeded. The cost of a Model T came down from $850 to $250 over less than a generation. And yet, there are a lot of things about that model that were maybe relevant at the time, but less relevant now. When you go back late 19th century, the majority of people were illiterate, not only poorly, just illiterate. And so you needed a new kind of super employee called a manager to tell those people what to do. It was also a time when information was very expensive to acquire and to move. And the easiest way of doing that was to have 10 employees or so report up to a boss. They would consolidate that information, report up again through the chain of command. And in that model, only the people at the top had the full picture because everybody at the bottom was just looking at fragments. So in many ways, formal hierarchy forever has just been an information processing tool. Today, we have employees who are pretty well educated. We can move and share information instantly. So much of the logic of that old model has disappeared. And then, moreover, in most industries today, while scale is still important, while efficiency is still very important, you can't take that for granted, the real gains come from innovation, not simply everybody coloring inside the lines. So I look at bureaucracy a little bit like the combustion engine, a hell of an invention, served us well for a long time, but maybe now you know the costs are beginning to outweigh the benefits and we need to look for something else. You have a great illustration in the book. I think it's a really good modern one about like how specialization within bureaucracies do in fact yield economies of scale. So for example, like you say that specialization is why the iPhone costs a thousand dollars instead of ten thousand. And then with overly specialized roles, they have little room for improvisation because they are basically doing what an engineer thought up at some point. So my question to you is really, do we need both of these roles, the doers, the people that are on the lines, like basically putting the engineer's vision into this beautiful looking iPhone? for $1,000? Or do we need everybody to really think like an engineer? So they have room to innovate. You know, I think it's a both and, Brandon. Because, you know, as I said in the book, whoever's there, you know, putting your iPhone together, at that point, you don't want them to improvise, right? <laughs> no. There's probably only one way to attach the screen, and we're gonna have to do it that way. Having said that, I want that person constantly awake and thinking about gee, you know, the way the engineer did this, it's costing us three extra steps in how we assemble it. There is a better way to do this. Or maybe they're looking at the production line around them and saying, you know, this is like a bad handoff between this stage and that stage. There's a better way of developing it. Or maybe they're thinking of a completely different sort of iPhone. Maybe it's a much bigger vision and you'd like to hear from them. So I think it's the same thing in our daily lives. Each of us, every day, there's a whole set of mundane things we do from brushing our teeth to getting dressed to taking a shower, whatever it is. And, you know, it kind of sucks and it's boring, but like that is part of life. But if that was all you did, that would be pretty frustrating. And unfortunately, I think by categorizing those roles or by separating the organization out in these very distinct roles, we end up with a clever and then the people are just like grinding through stuff. And that's where I think we lose an enormous amount of imagination. And this is not a new thought. If you look at how Toyota became the world's biggest car maker, 
Toyota gets about 2 million suggestions a year from its employees on improvement. Toyota, for years and years, has just been getting more ideas per capita from its people than any of its competitors. And that's because it didn't treat those people as if they were machines. So I think there's certain parts of your work, you're just going to get on with it and whatever, and you have to do it according to the script. And that's important. But no employee should have that as 100% of their responsibilities and not have the option of thinking, of testing, of experimenting. I mean, you could imagine, you know, if a group of employees there on the production line in Han Hai Industries and Foxconn making the iPhone, if they have a better idea, maybe 20 of them get together, they should be able to crowdfund a little bit of money internally. Maybe they want to build a prototype of a different production line. It's going to take a few weeks and $10,000. There ought to be a process where they're able to do that. And yet, we know from our research, a big survey we did, Higher Business Review, in most organizations, 97% of people will tell you it's virtually impossible for somebody on the front lines to start something new, run an experiment that requires a little bit of time and a little bit of money. You said that the bureaucratic structure was good in its time, like any technology. But now you're suggesting, I think we're ready for something else, the humanocracy model, which is really the bulk of your book, where it puts individuals at the center of organizations. Why do you think that organizations are ready for this type of structure now? I don't know if they're ready, but I think they need it. (laughs) They need it. Yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) You know, our research, and we looked back at 100 years of industrial history, and we were just asking a simple question, Brandon, like, Why do some organizations win over very long periods of time? And we actually went back even farther. We went back 800 years into military history with the same question. Why do some armies and navies, why do they enjoy long periods of superiority? And when you dig into that, what you discover is it almost never had anything to do with technology or weapons or strategy or tactics. But what really gave that long-term advantage was organizational innovation. So it was creative ways of turning on human capability, new ways of turning on capability. So when the British invented the regimental structure and you felt you were fighting for your regiment, which is near and proximate, not a distant monarch, when the Prussian army first moved to a meritocratic officer selection rather than selecting officers on the basis of aristocratic birth, when Toyota started investing in Kaizen, continuous improvement, and was teaching blue-collar employees statistical process control, These are the things that unleash this kind of human capability. And so that's the broader historic reason for saying as much energy as we put on innovating in our operating model or our business model, we need to put at least as much and probably more in innovating around our management model. Interestingly, though, when you look at it, most organizations run essentially an identical management model. I don't care your industry, your country, doesn't matter. Power trickles down, big leaders appoint, little leaders Powerful staff groups set the rules, managers assign tasks and assess performance. Everybody's competing for the scarce resource promotion. So all this energy, all this work going into kind of managing all this administrative effort, and almost none of it produces competitive advantage because basically every organization is doing that just like their competitors. That's the big picture. That's like huge missed opportunity to be innovating in these areas. More specifically, it turns out that I think today organizations are facing a set of challenges that lie outside the performance envelope of that kind of authoritarian compliance-oriented management model. Today, organizations have to change as fast as change itself. And you see many, many examples of incumbents who've struggled to do that. Today, you have to innovate constantly. It's the only insurance against your relevance. And again, we know from our data that 94% of CEOs will tell you their organizations are not very good at innovation. And that has nothing to do with the people inside of them. And we need organizations that are daring, that are ready to take on these enormous challenges we face in society. So I think we have a new set of pressures on organizations that are going to require a new management model. And what's interesting is organizations struggle with resilience, struggle with innovation. They struggle to be daring. But as human beings, we're pretty good at all those things. And so the premise of the book, and hopefully the data there bears this out, is that in many ways, our organizations are less human than the people inside of them. And that's not surprising because they were designed to be so. If you go back and you read Max Weber writing in the early 20th century, the famous German sociologist, he said, bureaucracy is perfected to the extent it's dehumanized. So all that focus on specialization, narrow roles, rules, and oversight, great, that gave us a certain degree of control, but it also infantilized human beings that squandered a lot of their imagination, and we just can't afford to do that anymore. 
So I think that's one reason we have to go back to basics and say, listen, this technology of how we bring people together to do things collectively, we can't do individually. That is humankind's most important technology. That is the technology of human accomplishment. And yet the technology we're using right now, bureaucracy, is out of date. I think another reason that this is, I think, very current right now is you have a generation coming to work now really on the verge of the second generation coming to work who grew up in the world of social, who grew up on the web, believing that every idea should be heard, believing that you can't measure somebody by their credentials, believing that if you have followers, it's because they chose to follow you. And when those people go to work, they expect to find organizations that also live by those principles. And if they don't, they won't stay around long. So I think that's another reason you have to, you're just not going to get the brightest, most capable people if you can't figure out how to build an organization that allows them to unleash their entrepreneurial capacity in whatever organization they work for. I think it's interesting because you talk later in the book about startup organizations and just kind of describe how they tend to behave when they're early on in their business model. What can we learn from a successful startup that might apply some of these principles that you're sharing in the book about the humanocracy model? Well, you know, often we think of startups and their advantage being that they have like this new business idea. That's for sure true. But actually, I've looked at this long enough. I live right in the middle of Silicon Valley. And you realize the business idea is usually not all that new. It's been way before Elon Musk. I remember being inside at the highest levels of Ford and General Motors back in the 1990s. And there were plenty of conversations about electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. This was not like some surprise to somebody that this could happen. The real advantage of a startup is less that big business idea than just the nimbleness you have as a startup. You have few, if any, layers. People are kind of free to construct their own roles based on their strengths. You don't have a lot of precisely defined roles. Communication is very open and honest. Because you're small and taking on a big challenge, you intuitively think lean and you measure progress in days and weeks, not quarters and years. There's little of any formal hierarchy. And so that's the kind of organization or setting in which people give their best. But then, you know, what happens, and you see it with almost every small company, as they grow, at some point, bureaucracy starts to grow even faster. You add more layers, staff groups uh, swell up and get bigger. Legal has to sign off on everything. Employees lose their share of voice. You're layering in lots more managers. And so you move from something that's flat, fast, free, and open to something that's complex, timid, insular, and authoritarian, and with all the typical consequences. So I've always believed this was a lie, and I saw enough even decades ago to know it was a lie. But Brandon, at least for 20 years, management pundits and theorists have been telling us that it's impossible to build a larger, and by larger, that may only be a couple hundred people, but to build a larger organization that can be as nimble and fast and creative as a startup. And it's simply not the case. I just, before talking to you today, Brandon, I just came off a call with the chairman and CEO of Hire, the largest appliance company in the world based in Qingdao, China. And they run an 80,000 person organization that's divided into 4,000 micro enterprises. That's incredible. Every one of those little businesses is guaranteed the right to set their own strategy, set their own compensation, hire who they will. And it's just an incredibly, it's an enormous company that behaves like a swarm of startups. Now, there's a lot of subtlety behind that, how they manage to keep that from just becoming incoherent, but they have. So I think what we need to learn from startups is, yeah, there's an advantage to being flat and being fast and being daring and being lean. And we have to be able to capture those advantages in organizations of any size, and including in our public sector organizations. Because if we don't, that means that thousands, millions of people are not having the chance to do their best work. And that's not only bad for them, it's bad for us as consumers, it's bad for our economy, it's bad for productivity growth. But we have to get out of this belief that you have to be a startup to behave in this way. And what a lot of companies were told is, listen, if you want to do something amazing and cool, you have to build like an incubator, an accelerator. I call them a hipster money pit. It does seem easier to do it. And you separate that as far from possible as head office and you put all the cool kids there. And we've looked at those things. They almost never produce value for all kinds of obvious reasons, but they just never produce value. So the question is not how do you hive off the little innovative bits of your company. It's how do you inject you know, the DNA of entrepreneurship in every job and every role. It does seem like 
for a larger organization, it may seem daunting to even try to shift to this humanocracy model. However, I would think like, because they have so many resources, whether it's people or money resources, it could be done. It's just more around the change management is how do you change the paradigm, the way people are thinking about this hierarchical level, instead now putting power into people in the teams. Yeah. And one of the things we looked at, Brandon, you're absolutely right. It can seem daunting, but I believe what we need is something that is revolutionary in intent, but evolutionary in progress or in practice. Because today, we're all used to radical change in business models. So if I think about Airbnb versus a traditional hotel or Netflix versus broadcast television, these are radical innovations. And yet we don't expect the same kind of innovation in the way we lead, manage, and organize. And we must recognize there are radically different and better ways of doing this. The question is, how do you go from here to there? And when you look back, as we did, over 60 years of organizational innovation, from key groups to high-performance work systems, total quality management, Six Sigma, Kaizen, all the way up to agile and mindfulness training, the thing that strikes you more than anything else is most of those didn't make much of a difference. Within a year or two or three, they had been suborned, marginalized, or overrun by bureaucracy. And so you start to say, why? And what you realize is often we were trying to graft these new practices and processes onto the old bureaucratic root structure. Yes, exactly. We did not flatten the pyramid. We did not change our point of view about human beings. We did not shrink the staff groups. And so a brilliant book written by Art Kleiner on this called The Age of Heretics what he concludes, absolutely right, is he said at the end of the day, the empire struck back, that people with power found ways of reasserting it. And I think that's exactly what we're going to see post-COVID, right? COVID has pushed power out to the periphery because it's been clear the center doesn't know what it's doing. The thing is moving too fast. It's too complex. So people out in companies and healthcare, whatever, they're just using their ingenuity and they're helping us get through this. But I can guarantee you, because we've seen this movie before, as the crisis wanes, the center will want to reassert its authority. And we take some time to really lay out what do you do about this in immensely practical, almost hour by hour ways. But the short answer is all of us have to start behaving like hackers, right? We can't believe that somebody else is going to change the system. We can't wait for the CHRO or CTO or CFO to say, we need to change. We have to overcome the learned helplessness and say, right, if I believe I need an organization that's more experimental, more open, feels more like a community, any of these important post-bureaucratic principles, what do I do right now in my team? How would I run a little experiment? I'll give you an example. We had an organization I know well. A young team was wondering why it was so hard to get money for small experiments and to get experimental capital. So this is a unit of 60 people working in an e-commerce team. So they went to their boss. They said, listen, we want to run a little experiment. We need $9,000. We have 60 people. We want to give everybody $150 that they can invest in the ideas of their peers. And we're going to test this in such a simple way. Just for a couple of weeks, we'll put up a big whiteboard. If you have an idea that's not in the budget, you think it deserves funding, you put that idea up there. Everybody else can come and put up a post-it with a question, or they can write an investment commitment. I'm willing to give you 100 bucks, And they put that on the idea. They ran that for two weeks. $9,000 total cost of experiment, not disrupted to anything. And at the end of it, guess what? Some amazing ideas worked in the budget. People put their money behind the best ideas. And that simple experiment compelled the organization to build a very robust internal crowdfunding platform. So, you know, often we get frustrated by bureaucracy. We think like there's nothing we can do. And that's not true, right? You got to have that hacker ethos of let me start where I am. Let me fix what I can. Run an experiment. Test it quickly. Don't take too many risks. Don't blow anything up. Don't ask too many permissions. And then if it works, let's talk about it and engage others. And so I think, you know, all of us have that choice. We can bitch about bureaucracy or we can start to hack it. But the choice is ours. The fascinating thing about that example you just provided, I think the challenge with this humanocracy model would be trying to instill ownership amongst even the lowest level of people. And just that example of like just the $9,000 investment where people get a little bit of money where they can put it towards ideas and see them through. And what better way to instill ownership over ideas and see them all the way through than that particular model? I'm sure there's other ideas just like that that could be implemented. But my gosh. Yeah, there's dozens and dozens and dozens. In fact, 
we've done this work at scale in organizations. We worked with Adidas here in North America, the sportswear maker, and they'd struggled for years behind Nike. So we put up a little MOOC. Each week, we introduced 3,000 employees to a new kind of what I call post-bureaucratic principle, a humanocracy principle. One week it was openness, one week it's experimentation, one week it's meritocracy. And each week, Brandon, we asked 3,000 people, if we took this idea seriously, what changes in our organization? What would you change in our management model? So around openness, somebody might say, well, gee, we should open up the strategy process to every employee. Why isn't this just a firm-wide, completely transparent conversation about where do we go next? Somebody else would say, why don't we open up all our compensation data? Why are we keeping a secret what people make? That breeds suspicion and so on. Somebody else said, well, we need to bring our customers in much earlier in product development. We need to have an open product development process. So over about 12 weeks, 3,000 employees generated more than 4,000 management hacks. They evaluated them peer-to-peer review. We had, I think, 9,000 peer-to-peer ratings. The best of those, the teams went on to develop them into actual experiments you could run. But all of this was really, really grassroots. And the cool thing about this, not that I think of this in terms of a revolution, but the cool thing about this is when you have 50 or 100 or more employees saying like, this needs to change, here's an idea. And they're all saying, yeah, let's give this a try. No EVP or SVP can stand in the way and say, no, I don't like this. That's never going to work. And so the goal today, I think, of any change process is to make it open, involve people and work to build a constituency for the future that is more powerful and energetic than the constituency for the status quo. And today with social technologies, you can do that quite easily. And you don't need anybody's permission to get started. One of the things that drives me absolutely crazy about the bureaucracy model is politicking. I think there's such a power imbalance that people try to use politicking as a way to, you know, one up somebody else. And it's just toxic in my mind. When you move to a flatter organization like what you're talking about with the humanocracy model, do you see less politicking taking place? Yeah, you do. And again, getting there takes a few steps. But the dilemma is, if you think about it, bureaucracy is a massive multiplayer game, and it's played for the stakes of positional power. And so, you know, in the old model, power adheres to positions. You're a vice president or you're not, or a team you're not. But it's correlated with administrative ability and where you sit in that formal hierarchy. It's not necessarily that power is not necessarily very well correlated with your actual value added. We're all playing this tournament. We're all in this game. And to play it well, you learn a set of behaviors. You learn how to hoard resources, how to negotiate targets, how to deflect blame, how to push your rivals out of the way. And by the way, it doesn't make you often a very nice person as you learn to play this game. But the big problem, Brandon, is that these behaviors are just not correlated with value creation. They're correlated with value destruction. And yet, in another survey we ran, 76% of respondents said, Political behaviors are the primary way you get ahead in your organization. And so what you see in these kind of post-bureaucratic organizations is first, they get rid of a lot of layers. So when Hire went to their model, they redeployed 12,000 middle managers. Those jobs went away and they will never come back. Now, those people weren't fired. Most of them went to work in these microenterprises. And they're having a lot better time there than they were when they were like micromanaging and sitting in on planning meetings and doing all that stuff. But yeah, you have to change the game. And so at at Hire, these little micro-enterprises, everyone has very ambitious targets to outgrow their competitors, to turn their product businesses into platform businesses. When they meet those targets, there's a huge financial reward. You can make your base salary multiple times over. Every employee can invest in their own little micro-business and get a dividend when it does well. And so what you've done is you're aligning employees not up to their bosses, not up to the hierarchy, not to those big corporate goals. You're aligning them to deliver value to the customer. But for that to happen, they need to be in small businesses that feel like they belong to them. They have to have a real P&L, not a bunch of BS, synthetic, top-down KPIs or targets. They have to have a financial upside in their success. And it turns out when you give people that, they're going to behave like entrepreneurs and they're going to surprise you And when you have that kind of real accountability to the bottom line and to the customer, you don't need much. You don't need many managers. You don't need accountability to your manager. So we talked about the ownership over 
these teams and just like giving autonomy and all that. I'm curious about the information sharing. I think to make a model like this work, you would need a really fluid way to communicate, be open and transparent. What kind of tools or methodologies are you suggesting to make sure that the information is flowing rapidly so that they can make quick changes? Yeah, I think information, 100% right, Brandon. Information is just key to all of this. If you go back 100 years when the average enterprise is four or five people, everyone in that little enterprise saw the customer, right? You may be sitting at the back of a shop, but you saw the customer come in. You know what pleases them and what doesn't. You know exactly what your colleagues are doing. You can see them around you. You know what's on the mind of the proprietor, the owner. And of course, as our organization scaled up, employees lost a lot of that information that would allow them to be self-managing. And so instead, you know, the analogy I use, I'm a skier. and I've often seen these very brave, blind, you know, skiers, sightless skiers going down all props to them. But there's somebody behind them telling them you need to go left, you go right, you slow down. And I think that's a little bit how our organizations work, right? You deprive people of the essential information by which they can make smart choices. And now I need a manager standing somewhere behind saying left, right, stop. And so what you find in all of these organizations we profile in book, Nucor, Southwest Airlines, Bergsorg in the Netherlands, and so on. First, employees are taught to think like business people, and they have the full gamut of financial information. You can talk to a flight attendant or somebody handling bags at Southwest. They can tell you how seat yield affects profitability of the airline and how it affects their bonus. You're giving people deep financial information and you're investing in their business literacy. You're also letting every team know exactly where it stands versus every other team. So Birdzorg, which is the largest provider of home health care in the Netherlands, has 16,000 caregivers organized into small teams of 12 nurses and staff. Birdzorg runs a 16,000-person organization with two managers, one to 8,000 span of control. And you can do that because every team has real-time data on their hours utilization, on patient satisfaction, on efficiency of care. So I know, and I can see that for every other team, more than a thousand other teams. So I know exactly where I sit. Moreover, if I have a question, if I have a patient situation I can't handle, or I have a question, all those people are tied together on a very smart platform. You can go in and ask a question. Every question is archived. It's all searchable. So I can exploit the collective intelligence, not of of a manager, I can exploit the collective intelligence of 16,000 colleagues almost instantly. So that kind of information, the financial information, the performance information, and the ability to access the collective knowledge, those three things, give people that, then most of the traditional job of manager disappear. That work becomes just embedded in the everyday work of frontline teams. We covered a little bit of your book basically kind of a 30,000 foot level. There's so much more that I want people to learn about. There's so many good pieces in your book. And I encourage people to go get the book. But I want to end the conversation with this. In getting started on the path to humanocracy, you wrote that you can't demolish bureaucracy with a giant wrecking ball or a stick of dynamite. Instead, it must be dismantled brick by brick. So how do organizations take that first step? Well, let me say, as an individual, there's a couple of things you can do. And then you start to share, and then you start the movement. Number one, you start by really thinking about how you give away your own authority. How do you empower the people around you? And I think in the book, we give 21 tips on how to get that process started. Because what you'll find, if you're in a manager role, you'll find that as you give that power away and you help others grow, you mentor them, you help them define their own goals, you help them make bigger decisions, your job gets better too. That's number one, like, you know, start to give it away. Number two is be very alert to where you are operating out of that old bureaucratic model. You know, we all have to kind of do detox for bureaucrats and ask ourselves, when did I make a decision that really wasn't in the best interest of my people because I have all these short-term pressures? When did I pad a budget because we have an inflexible budgeting process? When did I kind of suck up to my boss because they control my career? And we give a very detailed guide of the sorts of bureaucratic behaviors we see in organizations. So start to do your own personal inventory. You know, every week, every month, go to your team and say, guys, I don't want to behave this way. You don't want me to behave this way. So like, let's hold each other accountable for this. So I think you got to do kind of your own soul repair work in a way. And then thirdly, build a hack, you know, take one of the ideas out of the book. Maybe it's a hack that's been run in another organization. That's fine. 
test it, try it, share it. But think of your little team as a laboratory where you can start to do this because it will, I can know people are so hungry for an alternative. They're so hungry for something better that when they see you doing something that works, it'll get legs and it will start to propagate across the organization. And there are ways of doing this more systemically at bigger scale, which we talked about in the book. But really, you know, it's going to start, I think, Brandon, with each one of us and the choices we make. In the same way, it's up to each of us on what we do with climate change. It's up to each one of us on what we do with racial injustice. It's up to each one of us to building a more human-centered workforces. And the thing that's been frustrating to me during my life as a management researcher, consultant, and so on is that I hear a lot of CEOs give these very high-powered speeches with the amazing things they've done. At the end of it, you go like, well, that's interesting, but I'm not the CEO. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? Right. And then you have a lot of people who tell you how to do better in your role, right? Whatever that is. And you can take your CE courses and you can whatever. But what you almost never hear, and it's the whole point of our book, is how do you change the damn system when you don't own the system? And when the word chief doesn't appear anywhere in your title. Because that is really waiting for bureaucrats to uninstall bureaucracy is a long wait. We've been waiting 100 years for that to happen. So I think now it's time each of us takes accountability, takes responsibility, and we try to give some really granular, detailed tips on what that means and how you can do it without blowing up your career. Well said, Gary. Your new book is Humanocracy, Creating Organizations as Amazing as the People Inside Them. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Anything that you want to tell listeners before we part ways? Anything about your book, about what you're up to, anything like that? Well, for sure. Follow me if you like on Twitter. That's where I kind of test out all the new ideas. That's at Prof Hamill, P-R-O-F, at Prof Hamill. The other thing I would say quickly, Brandon, if people go to humanocracy.com, if you buy the book, you get free access to four and a half hours online course, which is me, my colleague, tons of tools. There's literally templates for building your own hack. You can take your team through this course. And there's a lot of video and tips from the world's leading management renegades, from Zhang Rumi at Hire, from Yasta Block at Burzorg, from people at Southwest and Newcore and so on. So it is all the best of the people who are breaking that old bureaucratic model. It's all for free once you buy the book. So humanocracy.com and take it and use it and DM me, send me a message when you have some success because I'd love to talk about it. Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, Brandon.